Which one is the room? Hello, good evening. Okay, this microphone is on. How to introduce someone, a man who is the only <coughs> British architect to have wrestled an inflatable sex doll and lost, and in the process thought he'd gone blind and set himself on fire, and all on stage. The, uh, as Carl Jung said at the end of his life, people keep on making the same mistakes. This is what he'd learned about humanity. They just made them bigger. <laughs> How to introduce someone like this? Well, in 1963, James Brown used to employ someone slightly smaller than he was and slightly less finely dressed to come out and do the introductions. The man who did the introductions was Bobby Bird of the famous Flames. And uh, in the words of Bobby B Bird then, he would say, so now, ladies and gentlemen, it is star time. Are you ready for star time? <laughs> Thank you, and thank you very kindly. It is indeed a great pleasure to present to you at this time, national and international known as the hardest working man in show business, Mr. Dynamite, the amazing Mr. Please, 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 the star of the show, Mark Fisher and his famous fame. <laughs> studies lecture. Do we have two mics on here? We've got awful feedback. Or something similar to it. Yeah, that's, that's on and, yeah, all right. Sorry. I, I know that this has been billed as a general studies lecture, and so it was something of an embarrassment to me as I began to put the slides together to realize that what I'm really going to talk to you about is scaffolding. Um, I realize this because the way that I going to present the work that I'm showing to you is just by showing you lots of pictures. That's really, it comes about because there are no theories to this stuff. It's just um, really getting out there and doing it. And what we do in my office is essentially produce things that are visual, things that are measured by starting at a particular moment in a very controlled way, and going through with the show and ending. And so the two shows that I'm going to talk about are going to be presented exactly like that. And in addition, what I'm going to do is show you a lot of photographs of the scaffolding that holds the show up. So that's, um, I suppose, also not very different to the way that a lot of contemporary architecture is done insofar as what we really do is take a very low-tech construction system and dress up the front few inches of it. And uh, I was thinking about Canary Wharf and Broadgate and all of those things, and realizing that probably the architecture of stage sets is no different to any other commercial architecture that you might choose to look at. I'm going to talk about the US and European tours, which the Rolling Stones did over the past year, and about the Wall concert, which we did in Berlin on July the 21st of this year. Jonathan Park and I are well known as the designers of this stuff, and the thing that doesn't really come across in a lot of the press that we get is that we're the spearhead of a very large team of people, some of whom work in our office, and a lot of whom are the crews, the technicians, and the department heads of the production teams that create the shows with us. And so, because I'll probably get too involved in the slides to remember to say this as I go through, I'd just like to remember them that I think probably more than in any other form of design that I'm aware of, we actually work very closely, but still as designers, with the people who actually build the things. We're on first name terms with the crews that put our structures together. Something which, when you realize that the Rolling Stone set was built 60 times in the last year, is um, in a way inevitable. We go to the site, we work with the people, and we have to be very close to them because sometimes that set that you'll see was built 
as quickly as in um, something like 60 hours from going into the stadium to opening the doors and letting the people in, which we should find if I get the first projector here. And we dim the lights and just move it a bit onto the thing. Do I dim the lights? Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so this, um, this stage set, which you see over on the right, was, um, as I say, put up 60 times in the last year. And often very quickly. So we find ourselves having to work very closely with the people that do it. And I'd just like to have you all bear that in mind. It's not something where we're creating these things and laying it on a bunch of Irishmen who then go off and put it up in some manner vaguely similar. We're having to be there all the time, experiencing the sort of danger and excitement of actually trying to do it when you know that you've got 100,000 people outside the stadium who are going to expect to be let in at 4 o'clock, whether you've made a mess of it or not. Touring shows, such as these big rock and roll shows have become, of course, have a long history. The great circuses in the USA in the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century are very interesting to me because they were far bigger than anything that you're going to see tonight. I was fascinated to read that in the 1920s, Carl Sadelmeyer had a circus called the Royal American. It was called the Royal American because it went into Canada, which dealt with the royal bit, and toured in the United States, which obviously coped with the American bit. And it was on the road from April through to November every year. It traveled by rail. It had 70 railroad cars, many of them double. And it had wonderful things like its own neon workshop in order to make the electric signs for the cities when they arrived. And it was, in effect, a complete traveling city. It had its own midway with fast food stalls. It had its own auditorium that it put up to perform the circus in. And so compared to them, although these shows that we're doing now are beginning to get back to that kind of grandeur and spectacle, I think it's, uh, it's still got some way to go before we catch up with the kind of thing that was being done 70 years ago. And the stuff that we're doing now really started in 1965, 25 years ago, with the Sid Bernstein concert that he put on with the Beatles in Shea Stadium. That was the first time that anyone had dared to hire a stadium and put on a rock act and see what happened. And 55,000 people turned up and paid $6. And that was the beginning of what still goes on today. Then, of course, hardly anybody could hear what was happening. and it was doubtful whether anybody could see very much either, and that probably didn't worry anyone, as indeed it probably doesn't worry many of the people who come to see our shows even today. But it started out an industry which has gone on to produce a lot of special equipment, so that whilst the fact that people can't see and hear sometimes doesn't bother people, the fact is that we now operate with highly specialized PA systems of up to half a million watts, and with very specialized lighting and occasionally specialized scenic elements. But the thing that I think you'll see when you look at what I'm going to show you tonight is that most of it's still very low tech. And as I said at the beginning, pretty much everything that we really show you is built on a, the front few inches of a massive construction of scaffolding. So I think we start looking at the slides. The map on the left here is a map showing the tour of the United States of the Rolling Stones show. And it conceals some rather interesting things apart from showing where most of the people live in the United States. One of the things that led to this choice to use scaffolding came about in a period of four weeks when, due to the vagaries of the baseball season, they decided to play New York starting on a Wednesday and Thursday of one week. The following Wednesday, they were in Los Angeles, where they played from the Wednesday to the Sunday. Then the following Wednesday, they played again in New York from the Wednesday to the Sunday. And then the following Wednesday, they appeared in Vancouver. Um, it's not absolutely clear whether the tour had been booked by somebody who was blind. <laughs> 
but um, it was certainly a great benefit to be working with a construction material which was so cheap that you could safely leave great stacks of it rotting in truck yards on both sides of the United States while you went from one side to the other. And that was one of the fundamental decisions which stopped us doing what really with a budget of the size that we were working with might have been the obvious choice, which was to have built some pretty frisky high-tech solution that would have eliminated an enormous amount of crew and all of that sort of thing. Now, the, the thing that, of course, is a problem when you do a rock and roll set is you have to decide what it's going to look like. And the, um, the conversations with Jagger started uh, with various ideas which he had of wanting to produce something that was sort of adjectives like tough, urban, <laughs> you know, like the stones, bit, bit decayed but old-fashioned, that kind of thing. And I, of course, had... This is the one moment you get when you can inject your own prejudices into the thing. And I went straight off on a tack of mine, which uh, came about because I'd been reading a lot of William Gibson, the uh, punk sci-fi writer who describes these wonderful reuses and re-inhabitations of old industrial structures, things like gigantic fuller domes that would have been drawn in the 60s as the ideal way of covering New York. He envisages what happens when the thing decays and becomes completely inhabited by a lower class of people who are climbing around in the girders and everything else. And so these sorts of images were the kind of things that I took to show the stones as examples of derelict 20th century technology, particularly the Cape Canaveral shuttle launching thing on the left. And I did some sketches which basically set out how such imagery might be expanded across the whole end of a stadium because what we were wanting to do was take command in the same way as circuses were able to take command of their environment when they used to tour with their own big top. We wanted to take command of the stadia in which this show was going to play and the simple answer to that was that whatever we put in it needed to be very big and able to dominate a space which is already very big and has its own particular aesthetic. And we moved rapidly through a series of models and sketches which are quite consistent to the original image. The title of the tour had already been decided at this time. It was the title of the album that they were about to release called Steel Wheels. And as you'll see in a moment, we picked up on some of the graphics that were produced by very good friends of ours, a London design firm called Four Eye who had got the rather coveted gig of doing the graphics for the tour, and we spent a lot of time swapping ideas around, and they eventually developed something which we cribbed wholesale in the office to come up with all the funky details on our set, saved us a lot of time. Um, we also had this idea for having inflatable women. There were a few songs in the proposed set list which seemed to go with this sort of treatment. <coughs> the original idea was quite non-sexist and well-balanced. It was to have a couple of gay sailors and a couple of young ladies, but the um, proprietors of the band decided they didn't want any sailors and they just wanted to stick with the women. Um, <laughs> who were originally, as you see in our model on the right, um, to sit on the roof of the structure. But uh, the American scaffolding company that we worked with completely chickened out at this point. They decided it was far too difficult, expensive, a great long litany of totally feeble excuses. So it was only when we got to England that we were able to show them that a British scaffolding company can do with one hand tied behind its back and Margaret Thatcher for Prime Minister what <laughs> they can't even begin to do. Um, these are images from the graphic designers of the source of the motifs, the circular saw blade and the smashed up. CD, which became, by degrees, the album cover artwork on the left and on the right, the graphics that we used on our painted canvas flats in the stage set. And we also, as you'll see in the slides of the show, produced some very nice images which were projected onto the structure itself with very large projectors. One of the things that is common both to the Rolling Stones shows and to the show of the wall, 
is that we've tried to develop a graphic style for the show which can be used. So this is a, at one level, a completely crass commercial thing of corporate identity and all the kind of stuff that makes ICI and Bovis great. But on the other hand, it does give you a place to start in actually playing around <coughs> with the kind of designerly qualities that come from working with a consistent image. I mean, it's almost true to say that the idea of corporate identity and design has been pirated by these awful people who insist that everything that you get on on British Airways has to have their logo on it. I mean, people like Frank Lloyd Wright and Macintosh were way ahead in designing everything from the teaspoons to the neighborhood in which the house sat. So it's not um, totally without a sort of honest pedigree to try to do this sort of thing. And what we will see is that it does produce quite an interesting way of dealing with one of the problems that we have with these stage sets, which is that unlike architecture, which essentially is a spatial activity where you create something which is a volume and your audience move through it, experiencing the thing to some degree at will, and they, they get the sensations as they move through time and space. Our audience is stuck in one place. If any of you have ever been to a rock concert, you'll know that's more than literally true. They, um, oh, we seem to jump two slides now. They, they can't move, and one of the things that we're trying to do with the show is actually produce in the thing that goes up in front of them a replacement for the spatial and emotional feelings that might come moving through a structure by changing the structure that they're looking at. We obviously have quite a lot of assistance in this arduous task by having a band on stage, which are, of course, giving a kind of pretty good performance at the same time. Um, so I wouldn't, wouldn't want to overrate what it is that we do in comparison to the music, but graphics do come into it quite a lot. Here, as I promised, you see scaffolding. And you also see the great property of scaffolding. It's put up by men. Um, this makes it enormously convenient and comparatively cheap. And also, as each piece is by definition capable of being lifted by a man, it means that there is almost no venue in the United States, Europe, or the rest of the world that you can't get a structure designed out of scaffolding into. This is very important when you're designing a tour because you can always look at this the sort of thing and say, well, it would be great to do this or that with a crane. It's absolutely true, and in Berlin you'll see that we did use cranes quite a lot. But in this kind of touring situation, you may find that one of the venues that's been booked by the blind man who arranged the elegant transfer between Los Angeles and New York and Vancouver has also been chosen because it either has a pitch with electric heating underneath it, perhaps even something more sophisticated like an ice system underneath it, or even a tunnel like at Wembley, which is too small to get a crane through. And so it's then that you'd be very embarrassed if you'd come up with something which was really clever but needed a hydraulic crane to put it together. So almost everything that you see on the Rolling Stones set can be carried around in its most elemental form by two people. The scaffolding is the start of that. The lighting units, which you see going on to the scaffolding here, were designed also to take advantage of ganging a lot of lights together. Each of these things is a pod about eight feet square containing 50 kilowatts of light. <coughs> and they get wheeled around. They travel like that in the truck. They just get wheeled out of the truck onto the stage and lifted up by chain hoists into the structure which is being built in these pictures. Hanging off the structure, you can also see moving lights, which we'll come to in a minute. The main decorative elements of the structure that we're watching being built here are these the, the crew called them architectural trusses. This was really sweet. They couldn't, couldn't actually just call them trusses or girders. They had to blame the architects for them. So <laughs> they called them architectural trusses. These things packed flat. You can see a bit of the detailing and the one in the foreground on the right. Travel very compactly in dollies and assembled and have this um, painted distressed glass fiber corrugated stuff on the, on the front. They get lifted up by beams which cantilever over the top of the structure 
and have chain hoists down in the bottom going over pulleys embedded in the beam so that the thing is lifted up as it were by its own crane and the one on the left as it goes up the bits and pieces of the zigzag get fitted on underneath it you can see them here constructing this element on the balcony as it goes up and so as I said all this stuff starts out life being man liftable and then gets moved towards cranes which effectively have been built inside the structure this is the stage left one going up and being joined together and <coughs> you can see on this um, tower here just the little silver elements at the top those are the cantilever beams with chain motors that are lifting those things into position the other major th one of the two other major three dimensional elements in the decoration were these things which the crew called snoops these were the subject of the most horrific arguments in the design stage with the various departments that were most affected by them notably the people who were the sound engineers for the sound in the audience and the engineer who was responsible for the sound on stage for the band to listen to because they had this totally unreasonable belief that aluminium is opaque to sound which I mean you know if you've ever been in an aeroplane it's obviously absolute rubbish especially if you're outside the aeroplane but um, they were very concerned that these things would stop the sound reaching the audience in the middle and all sorts of things so in the process of the rehearsals with this show we went through various forms of truncated snoot we had the things seriously discussed as whether they should be made out of canvas because they thought this would be more acoustically transparent and a whole load of stuff but common sense won in the end and these rather wonderful and totally unnecessary objects got attached to the front of the structure I say totally unnecessary but of course like all good functionalist designers we planned to attach an, an enormous amount of stuff to them in order to defeat any argument that they should simply be dispensed with <coughs> and so you can see that we have a lighting pod hanging off and we have a little position at the end where a man with a spotlight can sit one of the most terrifying positions to be in the entire show and also <laughs> the loudest and um, a great bunch of loudspeakers for providing the sound to the stage which are hanging inboard of the snoot you can see on the right this is the uh, detailing of the roof these um, elegant devices were designed to use the smallest amount of material and take up the greatest volume of truck space that anybody could actually come up with um, they've they sort of found a home eventually on truck on top of each of the trucks that were used they sort of went around with two on each one we had 96 trucks in the end so they had plenty of trucks spare and they're an example of the decoration that was derived from the graphic design and um, here looking more closely at the various lights that accumulate above the balcony the, um, the big pods of lights had computer controlled color changes in them so that they were as you'll be able to see in the photographs able to summon up a whole range of colors and then additionally we had various spotlights on levels and the structure that they're built into has two spotlights on each of the intervening levels as well as on this lower balcony and then there are a number of 5k film lights which are down at the bottom and then for the first time in detail here you can see the detailing of the balustrade which again derives from the graphic design this was the third major three-dimensional element which went on to the scaffolding the scaffolding was configured to produce a shelf or balcony at an intermediate height about 20 feet above the ground and then these elements which travel as you can see quite neatly in these carts got taken out and they clipped straight onto the scaffolding the swagging between them is a chain link aluminium netting material which produces quite a nice effect and then one of the clever things I thought about this balcony which was down entirely to Francis and Evelyn in our office last summer was that they they had a great insight which had been troubling me a lot of making the balcony much the balustrading on the balcony much deeper than the actual level of the walkway itself and it 
it has an effect of making it have quite a mannerist scale in the whole design. I'd been pissing around with a horrible thing where the handrail stopped at the normal height of the balcony and they suddenly broke through with this thing that went down about another meter below the ba balcony level, the true level of the balcony. The, um, you can see there how far down below the floor it goes. The balcony balustrading had lights built into it and also at intervals along the handrail, the very light, which is an example of the lighting device which has been produced in the last 10 years, almost exclusively for use in the rock and roll business. They're lights which can be preset to point pretty much any direction that you choose. And they have variable iris and an almost infinite range of color and of focus. And we probably for the first time in a show like this put these all along the structure outside it so that we use them to light the architecture itself. And one of the things that this forced us to do was actually weatherproof these things because they're normally intended, well they are intended by the manufacturer for use indoors and it was with great trepidation that they agreed to hire them to us to put them outside and we built these sort of police visors to keep the rain off them and uh, remarkably they survived the trip. They didn't avoid getting filled up with water occasionally but you could usually point them straight down and all the water poured out and then they'd get on with it again. And um, another important aspect of a show of this size is that we provide video built into the set for the audience further back so that in addition to seeing the large scale presentation of the set itself in the arena, they get to see the close-ups which are mixed live from 10 cameras by a video director who specializes in doing nothing else. And by the end of the tour, it's getting very slick at anticipating all the stage moves and calling the cameras. And this pair of slides show you the screen on the left hanging in the structure, and then on the right, the lightproof sock that gets put on it so that the stage lighting doesn't come and back project onto the screen in competition with the video projectors that we're using. But of course, the main thing which gives the quality to all of this is the sound. And the sound system that got used on the stones is one of the most state-of-the-art produced by a Dallas company called Shoko and designed entirely by them. They have these neat cabinets which stand about one and a half meters high and hang one below the other. You can see that when they're traveling like this, they're each on their own wheels, easily manipulated by one person. And on the right, two of them being lifted up into the structure. They got lifted up into pairs to an intermediate level, which you see here on the left. And then up in the top of the picture on the left are a bunch of beams with chain motors on. And what's happening, very simply, is that the men that you saw before are bringing pairs of speakers onto this deck here. Other men are laying them out here. And then they're lifting this level up and rolling another lot of speakers on underneath. So the thing in common with the same principle of building all the architectural fittings is pretty much self-erecting. And by the time it's finished, as you see in the slide on the right, you have a very large pile of loudspeakers standing there. As I said, something of the order of half a million watts. And all the little wheels come off and produce arty photographs over on the right. <laughs> I mean, the, the trouble is, of course, that you see this kind of thing and you immediately want to turn the PA round and, and give that with light on it to the audience, which, of course, they never get to see. Um, so that's the PA from the front. And this wonderful siege tower on the right is the thing that's then put in the middle of the audience to totally destroy one of the great benefits of playing in a venue that can seat 100,000 people by eliminating about 20,000 seats. <laughs> that might be behind this thing. In that structure are all the people who control the various things that go on in the show. On the ground level of it, you have the sound engineer who sits there listening to and mixing the output of these huge loudspeakers. And behind him in the darkness, the video mixing. Above them on the first floor, you have the lighting people. There are effectively three lighting desks in there which are dealing with the very lights, with the regular lighting and a third desk dealing entirely with the automatic color changes. 
Above that, on the next level, you have the projectors, which are projecting our graphics. And on the top two levels, you have a total of eight follow spots. That's <laughs> huh, yeah. Well, I think these explain themselves, don't they, really? This is a, uh, a deflated and inflating and inflated honky-tonk women. <coughs> um, they come back later under stage lighting and then come back even later commemorating the World Cup. So we'll move on. To Pyro, they, some of the slides that you'll see feature some pretty uh, immoderate firework displays, which we put on the structure itself, taking advantage of the fact that it didn't burn very well. And a couple of men did nothing all day once the main structure was up, but rigged fireworks for about 10 hours all along the girders and things like that, which is what produces the effects that you'll see. What, a lot of these things are going on simultaneously, of course, and down on the deck, as soon as anybody can start it happening, they start checking the sound to make sure that the monitor or fallback system, which is what the band here, which allows them to selectively get fed either the drum or the bass or whatever they think they need in addition to their own. They get highly edited versions of the sound through all these loudspeakers, which you can see this on the right is a photograph of the front of the stage. Monitor loudspeakers alternating with flame tubes with explosives in. And um, on the left, Jagger trying out his monitors one sunny afternoon and standing, as you can just see, on his own private bit of oak dance floor. And uh, the monitoring on the sound is actually controlled from a desk which is just in a little pit off the side of the stage, so the monitor engineer has eye contact with everybody. And on the right, you just get an idea of how full the stage is with stuff, even though I think reasonably successfully in the show itself, it looks very empty. The thing that we were trying to do with the Rolling Stones was keep all the high technology that we had to use out of sight, because after all, and it sounds a bit pretentious, but they are really just a jumped up bar band, and we, we wanted it to sort of go down like that in the show itself. So I think these might well be the, the pretty much the last shots of the thing. This is then what we, Created and the, the record for putting it up was a 60-hour run from midnight on Sunday in LA Coliseum when we got in after a ball game to um, letting the audience in at 4 p.m. on the Wednesday afternoon. Um, as I said before, in the middle of this beautifully planned itinerary between the east and the west coast. Quite a large structure running right the way from one side of the stadium to the other and topping out at... Uh, somewhere around 80 or 90 feet. One of the things that you will see is that in fact, up at the top of the structure, there is a performance area and one of its more inconspicuous features is a passenger elevator which went from the bottom to the top in 15 seconds in order to <laughs> allow the proprietor to make a quick set change. So the show started rather in the way that we did tonight with a bit of pyrotechnics to get everybody looking in the right direction. Um, quite a nice shot of what it was like on the stage. Everybody had their heads down because it was almost unbelievably hot. And fascinatingly, the people who are working the video cameras, they're in a monk stick down at the front there. You can't really see them, but you can imagine what it's like to actually be next to this stuff when it goes off. And then we got pretty fast into doing some numbers and all these slides really show you is the range of visual looks that the set was able to achieve describing <coughs> various magazines as going all the way from space age decaying factory to romantic urban bordello and a whole lot of other <laughs> stuff that I probably am responsible for starting off but don't wish to comment on now um, they did achieve a remarkable range of of moods, which was down to Patrick Woodruff, the lighting designer's general ability to play things off, and also the fact that we'd managed to produce a very highly modeled object and had lights stuck all over it so that just about any piece of modeling you could find and bring out, and bring out in a range of different colors. These 
two slides show the actual workaday aspects of the of stage life. One of the girls working the video cameras, the video crew was an all-girl team out of San Francisco. And the uh, one on the left shows Jagger, and just in front of his feet, the video screen, which is pumping up not the lyrics, he doesn't need to be told what to say next, but it has all the kind of stuff that he needed to know about who was doing what and had useful things like pyro coming soon or, you know, inflatable women next and <laughs> th things a busy man on stage might forget. A <laughs> um, couple of nice shots of the band working. It, it did get a, a really nice moody appearance sometimes, but the, the stage itself remained visually very clear and open. And the, of course, the production of a show like this depended on having an enormous amount of rehearsal, and this is a pair of slightly off-the-wall rehearsal shots. The one on the left, when we were in the derelict stadium at JFK, where they did Live Aid in Philadelphia a few years ago, which is now condemned. And uh, we were there for the better part of two weeks, rehearsing night after night with all the lights, all the sound, and all of the band, and exposing quite interesting things like the backing singer's reluctance to go out in the rain without umbrellas, which you can see on the right. Um, they were given a pretty firm course of training, and uh, in future appearances were reasonably waterproof. A couple of shots showing the kind of image of the thing in a stadium. The one on the left is Los Angeles, the Coliseum, and the one on the right is Wembley. Uh, you can see quite nicely in Wembley because we were doing a, a movie there, an IMAX film, and uh, you can see the audience lighting and also the position of the siege tower in the middle of the field, which has a video screen on the back of it, which is why the crowd goes pretty uniformly around the back because it was quite a nice place to be if you wanted to have a slightly lower density and just watch the TV, which was a very good show and not one to be ignored, and it was quite a nice place to take a rest from the enormous crush up at the front. And while the show's going on, this is a view of the lighting area on the left, people controlling the various things. And on the right, a wonderful underworld, a sort of Piranesian series of tunnels that exist under the stage, permanently lit, with people padding up and down, checking that all the amplifiers are working. Or indeed, occasionally, not so much padding as fleeing in blind panic. On the opening night, at the end of the second song, we lost all the power to the sound. It was dreadfully embarrassing. Um, and there was sort of three minutes of complete silence, which is rather <laughs> hard, to, hard to deal with, with a baying crowd of about 80,000 Philadelphians getting upset. Though I'm sure life in the corridor was less tranquil at that moment. The, these are a couple of slides showing the uh, the projection over the structure. And what was interesting to us here, and we used it a lot more in the wall, was the way that it could totally transform the visual appearance of the thing. I mean, the kind of image of camouflage that we get here. And it was surprising the way the thing read over the black loudspeakers, the silver of the balcony material and the black of the netting below, more or less uniformly. You don't get any real sensation of one thing being less reflective than another. And also the video screens were able to punch through the whole lot and uh, still deliver reasonable pictures. A couple of nice mood shots there. This is per Patrick's purple look, whereas this is Patrick's steel blue look. And here we have the honky-tonk <coughs> women in yellow look. and. Uh, they're, they're pretty large ladies. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to relate to them in a sort of urban context, but probably if you blew one up in the, in the street outside, you'd be able to look eye to eye to it if you were standing on the roof of the building. They're a bit over 16 meters high. And uh, quite a nice shot on the left of life on the balcony, because Jagger I mean, the reason for having all these balconies and levels and things was because in the process of yielding a performance in an arena or stadium of the sort of size that we're working in, Jago, a man of legend for this, runs all over the structure all of the time. And it 
adds to the dynamism of the thing as far as the audience are concerned because they actually get to have him come up close on their side or whatever and these two slides show you him over at the stage right side at the foot of the inflatable. This is Patrick's um, look for 2,000 light years. And then we, uh, 2,000 light years had a very long instrumental ending in case the lift broke down. <laughs> and in that time, we got Jagger up to the top. And then he made his entry up on the top of the structure, which you can see in the slide on the right at uh, the beginning of um, Sympathy for the Devil. And uh, the whole stage just seemed to catch fire with these wonderful red flares. And um, then he came down and carried on singing at a lower level. It was a remarkably dramatic thing because his descent was extremely fast and he more or less stopped one verse, dropped down and came in on the right hand side of the stage singing again. This is the red look. And, <laughs> and then, with then, of course, the, the looks, Patrick was very versatile and didn't necessarily put all the looks in in the same order that I've shown them to you. But we then had an intermission which um, allowed everybody to settle down before the thing went into virtually completely white light with light on the audience and everything. And um, this is, as it were, the resume in that intermission when the thing just looks like an oil refinery. And we came back in with the first fireworks in sympathy, a lot of white light, and then just set the whole thing alight for the end of the show, which was quite dramatic. And um, sometimes got lucky and managed to get the symmetrical arrangement of the fireworks that went on outside the structure as well. Well, you might have thought that with something as sort of reasonably full of impact as this, that when they came to Europe, they would decide to just carry on touring with it. But a great <coughs> mistake in that view would be that they also had accountants who'd been running a book on this thing while it had been touring in the States and decided that even though it had played to three and a half million people and made some stupid amount of money, it um, was not making enough money and that they would rather see something that was produced with fewer trucks and had a sort of different image to it. So we then set about talking with Jagger about things that we might do instead for a summer tour in Europe. And this next series of slides are interesting because what you have to realize is that for all you functionalists out there, you're about to see a series of studies on precisely the same building being taken through a rather different series of facades. It's really rather like Barrett Holmes. You can have the Tudor version, or you can have the John Alexander jungle version. This is, of course, the same stage set as well as steel wheels, because in none of these shots are any of the technical <coughs> aspects altered at all. And the, the um, John Alexander <laughs> one um, proposed this rather fabulous series of inflatables. Um, which it was intended would blow up during the show, so it would start like the slide on the left and end up like the slide on the right. I particularly liked the alligator on the roof. I thought that was a great move, that, and a big mistake when that got elbowed. Um, then we, <laughs> we realized it was actually the year of the Rottweiler, so we, <laughs> so, so we tried them on dogs. This was Mark Norton at Four Eye practicing drawing dogs. Um, fortunately, he has a sort of aberrant view of dogs and came up with this wonderful thing on the right, which we promptly christened Skippy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> were very, this is the, the dogs, the first dog scheme. There's a sort of, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm not embarrassed, but I do think it looks rather funny when you see it. <laughs> and when we got the sort of J.G. Ballard um, meets Mosquito Coast <laughs> look, um, I don't know what I've got to tell you this. We actually built that one. Uh, <laughs> things got so bad that we were running out of time, and we took the one on the left to Rotterdam, where I had an interview in the middle of the field in front of 200 people with an angry pop star who thought it ought to be changed um, two days before the show. So we, we then went on and came up with this one, which was 
year of the Rottweiler meets um, cave paintings of Lascaux, which was what we finally went with. Um, and the main thing in the change, apart from the, uh, the fact that they wanted the thing to be a little bit smaller, and you can see straight away that we've lost these great rambling balconies, girders, snoops, finials, and everything. And the, the major part of the structure in the middle that is over the stage is made of completely straightforward rented-in roofing components, which we simply deployed in a different way to the way that they're normally done on a rock and roll stage to produce this big painted header. The main thing that lay in our thinking was that whereas steel wheels had always played in darkness, the, the great impact of that show was that you came into the stadium, it was there, it looked rather run down and rough and almost as if it was part of the stadium. But then suddenly there was darkness fell, the stadium lights went down, darkness fell, and there was this enormous flash of fireworks that you saw. And the show started, and the thing was completely transformed. In Europe, because we're so much further north than they are in the United States, and we were playing in the height of the summer, starting in May and finishing in August, <coughs> spread on either side of the equinox, we always started in daylight, and sometimes even finished in daylight. And so what we were trying to do with this set was produce something, the colors of which were pretty bright and bilious, so that at least when there was nothing to do but put white light on it to get rid of the shadows, it had some kind of energy behind it. But it also had its own rather remarkable moods at night, and there were some quite nice touches to it, like these windows which could be lit in different colors and had depth to them. And um, the thing operated fairly well. And of course, it had the new Honky Tonk Women celebrating the World Cup with their footballs. <laughs> and it also had the inflatable dogs, which were created. Um, slide on the left, taken at Wembley one night when it was too windy to put up the one on the top. But on the right, you can see the top dog has appeared, showing the Americans that it really could be done. And um, these were marvelously spirited inflatables painted by a guy called Keith Payne, who's produced some really nice work, I think. I mean, they were just completely off the wall in insanely <coughs> psychedelic colors and just looked absolutely vicious. And, and well, the year of the Rottweiler, I mean, it just completely came to life. <laughs> and and the, uh, the great ending to Street Fighting Man, which these dogs were used in, was Jagger having a fight with the dog on the right. and. We had a man inside it, and there was a zipper in the mouth, and he finally poked it in the mouth with his stick, whereupon the man employed inside it seized the stick and just yanked Jagger straight off his feet and into the mouth. And, out of sight. <laughs> and the thing ended up with a cascade of fireworks as well. And that ends the Rolling Stones sequence, so I'd like to change the trays now, please. I'll turn these projectors off. And the next thing that I'm going to tell you about is the wall, which, unlike the Rolling Stones, the thing about the wall show, which we were doing entirely as a rerun of a show that we designed 10 years previously, the, it was something that was from the very beginning, a one-off show. So a lot of the design aspects of the thing were completely different to the Rolling Stones. We were not in this show intending to um, do something where we took it on tour, although people with less common sense than me are already talking of it. But it was strictly to be a one-off enterprise, and so for different reasons, we chose scaffolding, because this time there was no question of there being a budget to produce super widgets or anything. It was just the cheapest building material that we could find to yield the bulk for what, from the very beginning, was conceived to be an absolutely enormous project. The site in East Berlin was a, an area of land which used to be the Potsdam of Platz in the old United City. And it had been a no-man's land ever since the war, inhabited entirely by rabbits and landmines. And the, 
wall for reasons that I don't fully understand divided and totally enclosed this massive space which had a width across the middle of something in the order of 250, 300 meters. And the plan from the very beginning was simply to build a wall of um, about 18 meters height right away across from one side to the other. And in the same manner as the original show, to construct great pieces of this wall during the show itself so that by half time the wall was completely solid and then to demolish the thing at the end. The um, metaphor behind this rather unsettled piece of stagecraft being alienation. Um, site plans showing how the thing was to be deployed and uh, nothing dreadfully subtle about that. The two um, sides of the site represent the two boundaries of the original wall which ran from the Brandenburg Gate across the screen to the right hand side and the wall was after a bit of dithering around as to which end of the site would be best to place it was put across the site where you see it here with the upstage or backstage side of the um, site being occupied by an enormous tented city for the backstage facilities and the enclosed area on the audience side being reckoned to be good for about 150,000 people. In the event, it turned out that many more people came and fortunately this whole area of land with the exception of a few isolated buildings over here is completely flat and apart from an elevated railroad that runs across it, didn't really have any visual obstructions. And so that filled up with people as well, which is why claims to have had about a quarter of a million people there on the night are probably true. It's also true that anybody further back than the road that went across the site almost certainly didn't hear anything. It was, would be, in, in London terms, rather like standing at the Round Pond watching a concert on Park Lane. It clearly isn't all that good a place to be. Um, a few drawings which just explain in basic terms the way in which the show was put together. The one on the left, the first of a series which show how the bricks were laid in. Particularly they leave a series of holes as the levels go in. And the bricks are laid by a bridge which you'll see which elevates on two towers on either side of the stage. The bridge was 40 meters long and took about 20 bricklayers and a large number of bricks. And as they went up, they collected other bricks from adjacent levels. On the slide on the right, off to either side of the main gap in the stage, you can see two vertical rectangles just beneath the tower cranes. Those are where the loudspeakers go, and those areas were covered with painted gauzes to look like the bricks. And the tower cranes themselves were quite practical. They were a great assistance in the actual construction of everything. And then they were used to lift up lights and inflatables and various other things during the show. The other main thing that the show included was the fact that in order to deal with the idea of alienation, there are two stages, one on which the band play and are completely enclosed and cut off from the public, and the second one downstage of the wall, which is then used for a fascist rally and eventually when the wall collapses for the kind of denouement and revelation sequence and we wanted to have tanks for this fascist rally and so we didn't know whether we were going to get tanks but we decided to build the four stage so that it would take them if they arrived and we managed to get a fairly large truck instead to run up there in the rally and a few Russian military vehicles and a lot of people but you'll see this extraordinary structure being built in some of the construction slides and it really was good for the weight of a tank which as I say, disappointingly, considering the amount they have spare at the moment, we thought it was very churlish that they would not supply. The um, geography of this, you can see in this slide here on the, on the left, this plane here is the wall, and um, this is the fourth stage, and this cleared area going up here is the back stage, which eventually comes under a solid roof, which covered an orchestra. And these trucks, cherry picker trucks that you see 
built into the structure are exactly that. They have lights and things on them and move around in the show. There's also an 18 meter diameter circular projection screen hanging up there. And the bridge that goes up and down with the men on it, which lives just behind the, the wall there. There were, of course, inflatables. There would have to be inflatables in this show. We had a nice pig being painted in the Cardington airship hangar in the slide on the right. It was quite a big pig. And um, we also had some wonderful graphics. There were some great lines in the show. There's the great Jerry Hall, oh my god, what a fabulous room, and all these your guitars, which um, this is part of the artwork for. And uh, rather attractive cartoon sequence about alienation. And uh, a very nice cityscape. And then a work by my favorite German architect, Mr. Speer, which we parodied ruthlessly and put up for the fascist rally sequence. And you'll, these are photographs from the actual artwork that you will see projected. The site itself was not one of the best places to hold a rock concert. Um, <laughs> not, not least because the previous incumbents had proceeded to bury landmines all over it. Which, uh, it then fell to them to find said landmines and get them out, which took them quite a long time because apparently it's not the sort of thing you do in a hurry. <laughs> Some sort of poetic justice to it, I suppose. Um, and of course, like all good building projects, it was conducted in the foulest weather with um, rain and everything. And it turned out that the site itself, I mean, if you look, which none of us, of course, being in a tearing hurry and far too excitable had bothered to do. If, you, if we'd bothered to look at a street plan of Berlin, we would have realized that we'd placed the, the, build, the structure that we were going to put up right over the sort of equivalent of the terraced houses here around the side of Bedford Square and then out across the roadway and across some more houses and everything else. And so all they'd done, or I, I think actually we probably knocked the buildings down for them, but all the people had done after the war with the buildings that were knocked down is bulldoze it flat and cover it with earth. And so when we came to try and put the tower cranes up, we found that we were standing on top of basements and bunkers and all kinds of shit, which is all right for scaffolding, but not very good for something as big as a tower crane. So we spent a lot of time digging and doing all those proper architectural activities to get some good footings. <laughs> and uh, then we whipped up a couple of tower cranes, which was good fun. I mean, they're always nice things to do. And it's, I mean, it's great. I mean, having tower cranes that you can actually go and climb on because they're yours was a completely new experience for me and absolute paradise going right out to the end and taking photographs and things. It's very exciting. And then the 40 meter bridge, because there aren't a lot of people who do 40 meter bridges as a rental item, we went, we went to Bailey Bridge up in Lancashire and they came up with this delightfully um, lightweight structure, <laughs> um, more, which, which more later, that's a good line, isn't it? We meanwhile, again, because this was a one-off show, decided that the 18 meter diameter screen should be built of steel because we had cranes and there was no point in making it of anything lighter. Our natural instinct otherwise would have been to make it in aluminium so that it could be man-liftable. But here we were really enjoying the fact that we had these huge cranes on site. And the thing was lifted up and put into place and immediately the man with the most exposed job in the show went up to start fixing the berry lights onto the screen, which you can see on the right there. And this is the lightweight 40 meter bridge. Um, with the cantilever boom at the top which picks it up. It's a very simple system. It has hydraulic motors down at the bottom and pulleys and it just gets lifted straight up. Uh, sags a bit as you can see um, and was so extraordinarily heavy in its own right that almost nothing we did ever managed to overload it except <laughs> because we had a motor at each end and they weren't linked Three days before the concert, a man who was out of his skull with worry and concern at something, ran the thing up to the top 
and then ran it down without a lookout and managed to jam it so much that he completely spooled off the cable at one side and the thing didn't move because it was locked solid in its runners about 15 meters off the ground and just at a sort of very slight angle. It was really quite scary to see with all this cable hanging loose and we had an exciting time with Learjets and expensive people from Wigan to come and <laughs> sort the mess out for us. And uh, therein lies the reason why we did this show without any rehearsals. Um, this is the lightweight downstage tank supporting structure going in. <laughs> good fun. Well, one thing you could say for it was it didn't bounce and they had no trouble with the cameras on it <laughs> at all. No problems with rolling cameras around. And as soon as anything got there, and you saw the very lights going on through the screen as soon as they got up, as soon as anything was up, they put lights on it and spent this limited amount of darkness trying to get the lights focused and rehearse them. You can see here that they're focusing them onto early arrival prototype bricks which are standing on the stage and standing in for the equally active players who came later. This is the arrival of one of the first um, styrofoam bricks and they rapidly get put in and become part of the game. And this is one of the other scenic artifacts, a large thing called the mother brick which is a thing about the size of a double-decker bus with perspex on the front painted on the back with a Gerald Scarf cartoon so that when it's backlit it becomes a picture and in the song Mother this thing was lifted up from the ground carefully choreographed by the tower crane and dropped into the spot which you can see behind it. And so in the period that ran up to the show all this construction continued. This is Albert Finney on the platform in the front which is used in the fascist rally taking a look at where he has to come and be the judge. And on the left, the lintel brick that goes in over one of the big gaps in the front of the stage being tested out. And the thing obviously became quite a, a sight in Berlin in the days that, during which we were building it. We started building it on the 11th of June and did the concert on the 21st of July. So for us, that was quite a long time to have to build something, five weeks. It was quite relaxed really I suppose compared to the sort of get-ins that we had for the stones and um, that's the backstage city which <coughs> sprang up during the course of it for all the TV people and everything else and a view looking along the top of the wall of the styrofoam bricks which the styrofoam bricks were stayed back to the scaffolding with a very simple arrangement of rope and a piece of wood so that the piece of wood lay in the trench at the top of the brick and the next brick and the rope was attached to it and tied back to the scaffolding and then the next brick sat on and stopped the piece of wood coming out and by this means the thing was stayed back to the scaffolding against the wind but also by pushing in rows from the top was capable of being made to fall over. This is a look at the, the other inflatable puppet who made a brief excursion to Los Angeles to try to drum up support for the video that was going to be made of it. The, uh, the finances of the show were quite extraordinary. It was financed entirely by, um, as it were, subscription from various things. They got money from the advance video sales, money from an advance album sales, and ticket money on the gate. And the total of those came to $9 million, which is what it cost to do it. And not a penny of public money, as they say, and a good thing too, I think. Let's to see what was done. That's the mother brick lit up and people practicing with the projectors. And one of those other great jobs you can get if you decide to go on the road and become a rock and roll roadie, focusing the lights on the long truss, which um, is something I'm sure a lot of you would like to do, given the chance. These are the five projector towers in which we had the seven kilowatt projectors that project the graphics for the show and the testing of the projection on the right. And a couple of shots just showing the general scale of it as it was coming together on the 
final days, the gigantic tank-proof four stage in the slide on the right we're looking down at, and the uh, bridge with the brick layers on it. And you can see, rising up from the bridge, slender wind masts, which were used to stabilize the bricks in the central open portion. These masts were linked to the main bridge itself by rollers so that they effectively were spanning vertical columns when the bridge was up at the top and provided all the wind stability to stop the central panel brickwork from collapsing. We had a lot of people to train because we had, um, we had brick layers. Obviously, they practiced indoors for quite a long time until we had enough construction to allow them to play outside. And we also had a lot of extras who took various parts in the fascist rallies who were drilled by Wayne Eagling and other choreographers to get them to look sufficiently vulgar and unpleasant. And uh, here's some shots of the bricklayers training when they finally got out to play with the thing itself. And you can see the wind masts there very clearly going up. And the shot on the right is from underneath the, the bridge. Once the bridge was up in the air, there was a whole pile of stuff that came up to stage level to fill in the hole and indeed to allow access to go through the wall quite high up because as you'll see in the show itself later on, people come and go through the wall at a position about 20 feet up from the stage. More um, bricklayer training here. And then finally the day of the show with our, our man who insists on being on the circular screen fiddling with the berry lights still up there. <laughs> in the afternoon. He wasn't going to be stopped. And uh, that must be in the early part of the afternoon. The site is already filled practically to the back boundary and you can see the area of open ground behind which um, eventually filled up as well. And uh, shot from low down just before the show started and then from the hotel in the distant part of the site as the sun set and the show began. I won't dwell on the story too much because apart from it being obvious, some of you may know it, and it's not, um, it's an awful lot of story for a very simple idea. But basically it begins with a, a sort of neo-fascist rally. We had the Scorpions rush on in white limousines and motorbikes, play a quick little number under red light, and then the thing settled down again to a number of quiet, tunes, one of which was sung by Uta Lemper, and then we began to pick up with a bit of action. The teacher appeared with Cindy Lauper doing some very nice um, caning motions, which are exciting to all the English people there. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, you can see there the projection on the 60-foot diameter back projection screen as she's down at the front. You're looking here at a show that was designed very much for television and in choosing these slides I've tried to get some sort of sense of that because we were dealing both with a live audience which needed to have this massive scale thing to look at and also with TV cameras which are as close to Cindy as this camera so that the eventual TV product had a reasonable mix of, of effect in it. This is the mother brick in the process of going in. It was one of the tensest cues that we had to deliver because it had to actually drop in and go out right on the last note of the song. And the, the crane had been used right before for lifting the teacher's cane. So it was a fairly busy night up there for the riggers who were docking this thing. And as I said, not, not the world's smallest object to be fooling around with on a slightly breezy night. And um, here, also in Mother, I think, projection of one of Jerry's pictures of the fabled lady and uh, a view of the thing, again, from the hotel at the back, showing the thing as it looked from the distance. Sinead O'Connor came down. And um, at this point, the, they were downstage join this number and we had to do quite a number of things very quickly in the number before they could come back again and you can see quite clearly here we've put 
a brick, a big spanning lintel brick across this opening, which is their only access back to the main stage, and the bridge, which has been down at ground level to allow them to walk through, is now obstructing that gap, and it has to be got out the way in one song, and the platform that fills up the hole so that people can walk back has to be got into place. That was sort of vaguely nail-biting moment. And then after that, the people putting the bricks on were able to roll up pretty much in their own time. They were just racing the band. And then the <coughs> picture on the right, you can see the audience outside. And uh, this is a song called Empty Spaces. We had 150,000 cardboard masks made, and the audience were asked to hold them up at that moment to symbolize the sea of empty faces that were part of this alienation song. Rather nice scarf image on the circular screen and the slide on the left. Brian Adams getting out there to sing Young Lust, because now they could come back and forth through the hole onto the fore stage. And then Jerry Hall with the great oh my god, what a fabulous room line, the slide on the right, which it's very difficult to get a sense of the scale of it, but that <coughs> picture is 200 yards long, um, is the Alex Quero's famous bathroom. She goes into the bathroom and has a, a great line about want to take a bath, and uh, that whole thing right behind her, as she was saying. And then we got into some quite nice... Um, cityscape work with a practical hotel room which you can see in these images a panel in the wall has opened up and there's a real hotel room there with sugar glass windows and Roger up in it getting himself ready to uh, when the slide on the right he's just smashed the window with a guitar and um, very good registration between the slide and the window I think you'll have to admit and then flings the various pieces of furniture in the hotel room out through the window. One of the delights of life on the road being achieved here, we actually managed to keep the electric lights lit as they went out through the window. <laughs> An important detail, we thought. <laughs> and then as we got to the end of the first half, Roger mouthing obscenities to the crowd as he finally gets completely bricked up and then the interval, at which point the wall is pretty much complete all the way across. And we went straight into the second half, which is the symbol of this complete alienation, the idea that the band are now behind the wall, the audience are out in front, and the first number was completely covered with wonderful graffiti photographs, which had been taken by a German photographer of the wall before all of these extraordinary things were taken down and sold by Sotheby's in Cannes, which <laughs> seemed to be an example of capitalism gone mad. And Paul Carrick sang the number right up behind the wall on the stage and appeared, as you can see in the right hand shot, only on video out the front. And, of course, on TV they make a fair amount of this symbolic gesture. And then... Uh, this is out of sequence, actually, but it's another song with Van Morrison singing on one side of the wall to Roger, dressed as a doctor on the other side. And Roger sitting in another Scarfian hotel room, this time down at the front, and having a series of extraordinary dreams about the return of Vera Lynn and people lost in the war, which were illustrated by some quite dramatic graphic sequences again, and the first really major appearance of our wonderful and highly trained German extras who came on doing these great sort of things with torches under these enormous projections, which looked pretty stunning at the sort of scale that they were being delivered at. And the, the climactic one was the chorus, Bring the Boys Back Home, with the Russian army marching band on the front of the stage and this huge piece of graphics going right across. And the shot on the right is quite nice because you see the silhouettes of all the projection towers that are putting the picture up there. 
And then we move into the fascist rally sequence. This is the great Shperian elevation projected up there. The start of this sequence involved a lot of vehicle movements and getting a great big truck with a band on it with the scorpions coming back up onto the stage with a whole lot of Russian <coughs> army vehicles. And then, of course, the magical appearance of the pig, front and back views here. <laughs> at, at the great moment when the bricks break through and he looms over the top with 20 Germans hanging on to the ropes at the back in absolute terror. <laughs> Once he started to go forward, you had no real way of judging that he wasn't just going to go completely forward and fall <laughs> into the thing at the front. The, the, it hadn't occurred to any of us until we actually did the dress rehearsal on the Friday night before the show on Saturday that there were vehicles moving underneath these bricks at the time that the pig appeared. And the people driving the trucks were extremely surprised. <laughs> Be, being Russian, there were communication problems as well. But, well. The only thing we can say is that fortunately it wasn't one of the open top jeeps that was underneath at this moment. And uh, the, the pig was definitely, for me, the sort of high spot of the three-dimensional artifacts of the thing, because again, painted by Keith Payne and designed originally by Jerry Scarf, it was just such a wonderful image of everything that it was meant to be, a symbol of oppression and people like Norman Tebbit and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Wayne Eagling's army parading in a complete parody of the Hitler, you know, all the sort of SS parades that one's seen in movies and in photographs. And it was incredible to be doing this pastiche there in Berlin. <coughs> it was quite remarkable that we were let out at the end of it, I think. And then after that sequence, the storyline continues with this idea of our alienated hero being on trial for his general bad feelings towards humanity. And the uh, slide on the right shows the means by which people made their entrance and exits onto this platform that you see on the left. Albert Finney there as the judge on the right on the platform. Tim Curry down on the deck. And um, Thomas Dolby, who you'll see in a moment, hanging and producing a wonderfully animated schoolmaster, Anuta Lemper, up on one of the cantilever girders that lifted the bridge, being the wife, and Jerry Scarf's extraordinarily vicious animation of the wife eating the hero on the projection screens at that moment. <coughs> and um, nice shots of Thomas there, who took to the enterprise quite wonderfully, including getting himself an absolute mad professor haircut for the occasion. <laughs> And uh, rather good wigs. Suta Lempo was absolutely magnificent, considering where she's standing, which is moderately exposed sort of place. And then came the great moment of pushing the wall over, which was absolutely nothing more than that. A line of people on the bridges and on the ramparts of the scaffolding, bridge descending, and people pushing the bricks off as they went by until at the, uh, at the end of it, the whole of the structure was exposed. And the band then got onto the bridge, and it w rose up again to allow them to do an encore, which you see here. And that was it. So two shows, one of them a touring show, the other one an undesigned, I think, really, um, but reasonably well executed, large outdoor one-off event. As I said, I have no real theories about it. I think the story is all in the pictures, and if any of you want to ask me any questions, I'm sure we can do that. So we should have the lights up and the projectors off. Thank <laughs> you.
utterly insane. <laughs> How do you keep your nerve to do those things? Well, it's... I remember when we did it the first time, you kind of... You thought that it might go wrong. <laughs> and then it did go wrong, and you found you were still alive at the end of it. And, you know, I mean, what do you do? You just take the thing on, and you do it. <laughs> Get away with it, and do the next one. Oh, practically none on the Rolling Stones. It was they would chop bits off the ends if the stadium was too small. But it was pretty much designed to fit in to any of the stadia that it went into. So there was not really any need to make big adjustments. generated ourselves. We carry uh, two or three generators that stand out the back and run the whole time. It, it's mainly, it, it's not because some stadiums don't have power, but not all of them have power, so you end up having to hire them on such an erratic program that once you're committed to it, you take them with you all the way. Thank you very much. Thank you.